And my paper is on bondage, human environment interaction, and the 1863 regicide of Radama II of Madagascar. Now, um, I've already produced um, in a previous um, conference a paper looking at that particular regicide um, in terms of the of of the environment. Um, now, talking about the regicide, uh, Radama's death, his assassination in 1863, has been analyzed pretty much uniquely in terms of a conservative backlash. And while I looked at the environment in the previous paper, I want to um, focus particularly on the significance of bondage, albeit within the context of human environment interaction. Now, um, Madagascar, as you know, is um, an island lying to uh, in the Indian Ocean off the east coast of Africa. It's the fourth largest um, island in the world, um, bigger than um, something like two and a half times the size of Britain. Now, the main sectors, if we're looking at uh, bondage, we're looking at servile labor, and the main sectors um, in which this was applied in Madagascar was agriculture, the military, and industry. So that in the reign of um, Radama II's mother, Rana Varuna I, she reigned from 1828 to 1861, these were the chief sectors. And the, they were heavily labor intensive, and the labor sources were twofold, one was slaves and the other was forced labor, called in Malagasy Fanampuna. If we look first at agriculture, the economic base of the highlands of Madagascar, which is where um, Ranavalona and Radama reigned, is riziculture. It's highly intensive hydraulic riziculture. And here you can see um, the complexes that ran across both the valley bottoms um, and up the hillsides. It's very reminiscent of Indonesia and other places in the Far East, and this is what the um, mariner adopted in the highlands of Madagascar. As I said, it's very labor intensive. Here you've got um, people digging the fields and planting young rice, and in general the um, labor force for this was both free, so poor peasants, poor farmers, and slave. And here um, you've got slave boys and women threshing and pounding rice. And again, um, in terms of agriculture, immense um, um, herds of cattle, which were brought in from the Western Plains into the highlands of Madagascar. And we've got slave boys who um, were occupied looking after them. Again, in terms of agriculture, there were plantations under Ranam Valuna, there were plantations, um, sugar plantations created in um, with contracts with Europeans along the east coast of Madagascar, and they were run chiefly on by slave labor. Um, now, in terms of slavery, uh, the domestic structure of slavery was inherited slaves, so they were passed down through the generations, but also active enslavement. And under Rana Valona, there was an enormous amount of kidnapping, um, chiefly by gangs, raiding, um, war, so slaves captured in war, uh, trade, slaves were traded, and you could be enslaved for crimes. Um, this included principally debt. Then internationally, um, imports from Mozambique, and also despite an 1820 ban on exports by Rana Valona, um, exports due to Sakalava and Barra raids, the, the, these are the pastoral peoples inhabiting Western Madagascar, into the pla plateau, meaning a, a net loss of labor from the plateau. Here we have a, a picture from the 1860s of um, the Zuma slave market in Antananarivo in the capital. And um, you can see here the a child being um, 
being sold. Again, this is the network that involved um, the trade in slaves, both um, with, from Mozambique into Madagascar, but also from Madagascar out into the Indian Ocean islands, um, chiefly Reunion, which was controlled by the French. Um, and from the 1840s, there were um, the French also um, established bases in Grand Camor and in the islands off the northwest coast of, of Madagascar. Now, the second major institution which absorbed labor was the Mariner Army. And Ran Ranavalana created an enormous army um, in order to try to conquer, bring the entire island under her control. Remember, it's, it's the fourth largest island in the world. It was a huge task. But um, she created this enormous army, um, which, because of high mortality, um, led to also huge recruitment, recurring recruitment every year. Um, and this gives you some idea of the, the strength of the army. The main enemies and those who remained almost totally independent of the Mariner were the Sakalava. And you can see the Sakalava kingdoms in, in the western part of Madagascar. And then the Mariner, um, who conquered most of the east coast and the center, but um, failed to conquer all of, all of Madagascar. In advancing, there were enormous sort of battles. Um, the Mariner engaged constantly in uh, military campaigns. And one of the chief outcomes of that was enslavement. So that they, um, each of the peoples that they managed to conquer, they would kill the men and uh, capture chiefly women and children. And here we have some idea of the number of men killed in campaigns and the number of women and children enslaved and brought back into Antananarivo. So, for example, in 1823, uh, Ibuana, uh, 16,000. 1832, 14,000 brought back um, from Ivatu and Vuipeno in the southeast, and also from Ikongo, again in the southeast. So an enormous um, series of campaigns in 1832. Um, 1838, again, Vangandrano, in the southeast, this, these were the heavy, heavily populated fertile valleys of um, southeast Madagascar. And um, many, many of these were brought back to Antananarivo, but they were also shipped off to the East Coast plantations to work on the, um, in the, in sh uh, the sugar, um, sugar cane plantations and also uh, rum manufacture. Now, in terms of industry, uh, Ranavalana declared autarky and wished to build up an extremely strong uh, military, but one that was basically um, supplied with weapons by through domestic manufacture. So through import substitution, she created two major industrial centers um, with the chief aim of producing gunpowder, rifles, um, and, and cannon. And this is the site of one of the uh, major gunpowder uh, manufactories uh, on, in a lake below Antananarivo. That's the capital up on the hill. And uh, this was fed by water from the river Ikupa. So a canal was constructed, um, water brought in, and the water in this lake then um, drove the mills that produced the gunpowder. This is the second major industrial center uh, in Mantasur. On, it's on the um, eastern um, border of Imerina um, with access to water and to um, wood, which um, formed the major, um, uh, the major sources of, of, of power. And cannon were produced here so that um, by about 18, uh, 1840s, it was producing um, a steady stream of cannon for her army. Now, we've talked about slavery, but 
possibly the major, the most important labor force and servile labor force was um, Fanampuna. This is forced labor imposed upon the nominally free um, su subjects of Imerina. And these are the permanent Fanampuna units created by Rana Valona. And you can see there quite clearly makers of cartridges and gunpowder. Number of workers, 1,621. These were permanent. So, and they were unpaid. Um, the order came down to join a particular unit and the people who joined that unit had to rely on their families to provide them with provisions. They were not paid by the state. They were not given provisions by the state. Um, now, when it comes to um, her son, Rana Valona, when, uh, when Rana Valona died in 1861, she was succeeded by her son, Radama II. And his reign was short because he was, um, he was killed in 1863. Now, this was quite exceptional. Um, kings and queens were regarded as gods in um, Madagascar. But what Radama II did immediately upon ascending to the throne, he abolished Fanampuna, he reduced the size of the army, and he was rumored to be about to abolish slavery. Now, these were um, policies which completely undermined the Mariner elite and threatened to bring the economy crashing down. These, these were scary policies, policies that ensured enormous opposition to him. Now, at the same time, we have a series of adverse environmental events. In 1862, for example, a total eclipse on the 12th of June. There was drought in Amerina until the second week in December, and rains normally start in early November. And the drought destroyed the rice crop. In 1863, early 1863, a very strong La Nina, an outbreak of malaria, a smallpox epidemic, and the Coromania. And this is a, a kind of a dancing mania in which started in Betsileo in the southern part of the plateau and advanced steadily towards uh, the capital. And uh, it was mainly young female slaves who were involved, who were dancing, and they claimed to be speaking in the name of Ranavalon I. And they warned people as they advanced towards the capital that the reason that, Rana, that they represented Ranavalon I was because she was angered by the policies of her son, and that she herself had kind of risen from, um, there's a kind of afterworld in a, a mountain in, in Betsileo where um, dead sovereigns were supposed to live. And she, she left, or it was, an, it was announced by these girls, these dancing girls, that she had left her residence in this mountain and was advancing on Antananarivo in order to rebuke her son. All of this was inevitably blamed on Radama II's change of policy and uh, labor, the, the institutions of servile labor were central um, to his, his, his policies. It added opposition to him and a number of key uh, policymakers at court decided that he had to die. As you cannot shed the blood of anyone belonging to the monarchy, he was secretly strangled on the night of Monday, the 11th of May. And at 10 a.m. the following day, it was publicly announced that the king had killed himself and his wife, Rabudu, was proclaimed queen under the name of Rasuherna. She obviously had to accept the conditions which were imposed on her by the councillors who had um, who were behind the regicide. And it was immediately an, um, announced that Fanampuna would be reinstated and that slavery was not to be abolished. So what we see here is um, the importance, the central significance of servile labor 
and against the context in which these institutions of servile labor were challenged by the new king, the context, the environmental context was such that um, the gods and the dead monarchs were believed to be against him. And this was um, taken as the sign that um, his policies were intolerable and therefore that he should die. Okay, thank you very much.